am Dharna Noor, and we really need your help to make real news, so donate at the link right there. It's the Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert. January 1, 2019 marks the 25th anniversary of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Coincidentally, shortly before this anniversary, on November 30th, the presidents of the United States, Donald Trump, of Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto, and Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, signed a new NAFTA, a NAFTA 2.0, which was officially called the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA. Trump had threatened to withdraw from the old NAFTA if a new one isn't negotiated. Then, after signing the, uh, the new one last November, Trump and his administration praised the new agreement. Here's what Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue had to say about the new agreement. And this renewed NAFTA, USMCA agreement, is better in virtually all aspects uh, than the previous NAFTA. And we need this agreement. I think when Congress really looks at it, they'll look for worker protection for everything else. It's vastly improved, even for agriculture. Access to uh, Canada's markets is uh, improved. Uh, this is a better deal than we had. That's what President Trump promised, and he's presented a better deal. Is the new NAFTA really better than the old one? Joining me to analyze this issue is Lori Wallach. Lori is someone who has studied and organized against the old NAFTA ever since it went into effect in 1994. She is the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch and just published two reports, one on the old NAFTA, which can be found on the Public Citizen website, and one on the new NAFTA, which was recently published in the magazine The Nation. Thanks for joining us today, Lori. Thank you. So let's start with the old NAFTA, NAFTA 1.0, if you will. What would you say are the main takeaways from it 25 years after it went into effect? The big picture is that none of the rosy promises of the original NAFTA's boosters actually came to be. Instead, the concerns that critics of NAFTA, which were unions and consumer and environmental activists and family farm and faith group activists, Democratic members of Congress, their concerns became the reality. So we were promised that NAFTA would create one million new American jobs just in its first five years alone. Instead, there are almost one million specific U.S. jobs certified by the U.S. Department of Labor as lost to NAFTA, and that is just under one narrow program that is a big undercount. Or we were promised higher wages. Instead, we saw in the U.S. that wages are flat because as we lost a million manufacturing jobs, those workers went to the service sector where wages are at half the level. And not only did it show that their wages went down, there's a powerful Bureau of Labor Statistics study that proved that empirically, but the workers in those growing service sectors, the non-outsourceable sectors, with all the new workers flooding in, their wages stayed flat. And in Mexico wages actually went down. Real wages, annual wages in Mexico are 2% lower than before NAFTA, which is really scandalous because in 1993, the wages in Mexico are very low. Wages in Mexico are now 40% lower than in manufacturing in China, to put this in perspective. Not livable, obviously not fair. Or we were told NAFTA would be a boon for farmers, that we'd have basically new income for small farmers. Instead, we went from a NAFTA trade surplus, the U.S. sold $2.3 billion more agricultural goods to Mexico and Canada before NAFTA, we've now gone to a $6 billion deficit. And we have in that period lost 210,000 small farms. Small farms got clobbered the worst. We were told that NAFTA would improve our trade balance with Mexico and Canada. We had a small deficit with Canada. We had a small surplus with Mexico. Instead, now last year, we had a $177 billion deficit in goods. And in the service sector, where we were told that was where we were really going to win, service sector trade growth has actually slowed to half the rate than before NAFTA. So the overall deficit of goods and services has exploded 500%. So on basically almost every measure, jobs, standards of living here and in Mexico, what would happen to farmers, what would happen with the trade deficit. And then finally, we were told environmental and consumer laws would not be challenged. So environmental and consumer groups opposed NAFTA because they thought with all these new corporate rights in that agreement, we're gonna see important laws attacked. And now, 25 years later, $392 million has been paid out to corporations, 
by governments in North America after successful investor state tribunal attacks on our environmental and health laws. We've been required because of other trade cases to allow access to all North American highways to trucks that don't meet environmental or safety standards. We've seen the country of origin labels that we used to use in our grocery stores on meat wiped out as a, a legal trade bearer after challenged by Mexican and Canadian cattle guys. So we've seen exactly that outcome that we have been told wouldn't result. And the final, final thing is, at the time of the NAFTA debate, the Mexican president then Salinas said, we want to export goods, not people. You should do NAFTA because it will mean less migration from Mexico to the U.S. And then President Bill Clinton said something like, if we raise wages in Mexico, there'll be less of an interest for people to have to come here to seek work. Well, the opposite of what was promised happened, of course. The wages in Mexico went down. Almost one million small farmers in Mexico lost their farms to dumping of U.S. subsidized corn. The result was that undocumented immigration soared from a level of about two and a half million undocumented people from Mexico were here the day before NAFTA started. And at the, at the end of 2017, the number was almost six million people. And it's a lot of people who basically got pushed into making the dangerous journey because their livelihoods were destroyed by NAFTA. So very ugly picture, no doubt that across the political spectrum, a lot of Americans were very ready to have NAFTA renegotiated. Hmm. Well, now the Trump administration, as we just saw, promised that the new NAFTA, or USMCA, as it's being called, would be better. So let's first take a look at the main positive elements, if any. Are there any, are there any uh, improvements in the new agreement? Well, let me start with one thing, which is when the president talks about this when he talks about this agreement, he is making the same crass over sales that, say, President Clinton did originally. And on TradeWatch.org, our website, we have a really good infographic that has video of both of them. And they say almost the same things, which are just unrealistic. So let me just start by saying, even if there was a good replacement of NAFTA that, say, unions or groups like Public Citizen or progressives in Congress would support, it still wouldn't deliver the ridiculously grandiose, magnificent things that, that Trump is claiming. We're not going to have all of the lost auto jobs, a half a million auto jobs that were lost in NAFTA. They're not all coming back. Yes, we could create more manufacturing jobs here, but he is overstating it. And the agreement doesn't get a new name. He's calling it this USMCA rebrand. Well, that's just not what it is. It's NAFTA 2.0. It is not the transformational replacement of the corporate rigged model of NAFTA, but it is in some ways improved relative to the original NAFTA. So the biggest thing is that the investor state dispute settlement regime under which corporations can sue governments in front of tribunals of three trade lawyers, the lawyers can order the governments to pay unlimited compensation of our taxpayer money for any claim that a corporation makes that their special rights and privileges under NAFTA have been undermined by a domestic environmental law, health regulation, court ruling. The three lawyers' decisions are not appealable, and almost $400 million is paid out under that regime in attacks on environmental health laws, toxic spans, energy policies. So that outrageous system with the U.S. and Mexico is totally gotten rid of and with respect to Mexico is largely whacked back so that only a limited set of claims can be made. And only if a company has gone first to the domestic court systems, has spent, has basically gotten a final ruling from the highest court or spent two and a half years trying, they have to exhaust the domestic remedies. And then the big sort of corporate rights claims aren't allowed anymore. They can get money back if literally the government seizes their property through an expropriation and doesn't pay them back. So that's an improvement. There is a, a caveat to that that still needs to be narrow, but that's a very big deal. And that actually sets a new floor so that if this kind of corporate friendly administration is going to whack those outrageous investor tribunals and the corporate rights, it'd be really hard even for sort of a corporate friendly democratic administration to go back and restore that. So that's a really big improvement. Another 
important improvement is the agreement got rid of these outrageous natural resource mandatory export rules. Those are called proportional sharing. And if a country started to export lake water or gas or oil or anything, timber, then it had to continue those exports, even if it sought to, cons to implement conservation policies, it had to keep it exporting based on the three average of the three previous year's sales. So that's gone. That was a big environmental group demand. Added in is the first wage standard in any trade agreement. So part of what our overall improved rules of origin, those are the rules that determine whether a good gets duty-free treatment under an agreement. So first, that rule changed, so it's stronger, which means less, less goods that have a lot of value from, say, China or a country that wouldn't have to meet the other NAFTA labor and environmental rules. Those products can't come in anymore. Right now, a product that's half the value, say, from China can be a NAFTA product. Under the new agreement, the value, say, of a car would have to be 75% North American. But then there's a separate standard that says, and in addition, for 40% of the value of a car and 45% for the value of a light truck, it has to be made by a production worker who makes an average $16 an hour. And this link between a set wage and market access, it's the first time ever for a trade agreement. It's something unions have been pushing for forever. So there are complications with that. For one thing, that number, $16 an hour, isn't inflation adjusted, so it would have less value over time. But that, that's an important improvement. As well, the agreement gets rid of those crazy rules that were in NAFTA that forbid us to set environmental and health and safety standards for cross-border trucks and, for that matter, licensing and insurance standards for drivers. So as a sort of consumer safety and environmental issue, that's an important improvement. And then there are labor and environmental standards that are in the agreement, not in the useless side agreements, but in the balance of things, the way this agreement, I would say, is, is it is the good, the bad, and the incomplete. Okay, well, this concludes part one of our interview with Lori Wellack, Director of Global Citizen. Join us for part two, where we go into greater detail about what needs to be improved in the uh, new NAFTA. Hi, I'm Tracy Beal, the marketing director here at The Real News Network, and there's still time left in our end of the year fundraiser for you to donate. Donate now.